The scripture for today is just one verse from Isaiah chapter 45. And what we're going to read um, two times in different versions, one from NASB and then um, another from King James Version. So first, let's read one. Um, let's read the one from the NASB. It's from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Um, let's read together. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. Same verse from King James Version. Let's all read one more time. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For the rest of the year, uh, starting from last Sunday, I'm, I'm, I'm asking God whenever I prepare the sermon, Lord, what I should preach. Um, you know, especially thinking of um, our next step of our ministry for the next year. So I put the big title or, you know, as Smith Chapel Vision 2021 series. So this, today is the second Sunday of doing that. So um, I don't know. I mean, it may not really closely tied with the previous Sunday. I'm just asking God whenever I prepare the sermon, you know, give me the message that I should preach and I should, you know, share the people uh, with focus on the next year, um, you know, to prepare and um, to envision and to motivate ourselves. So uh, today, um, with the title of Look Unto Me and Be Ye Saved, I hope the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart from this message. God, what do you want to say to us? Uh, what do you want to say to us? Yesterday, at the morning prayer meeting, um, we read Psalm 99. Okay, the chapter begins with this word, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. We believe God reigns. We believe God reigns even in our bad times and good times. We believe that you know, there's nothing in coincidence. Nothing in coincidence is happening in this world. There's nothing that's out of God's hands. The Bible says everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. And Jesus said, even the sparrows will not fall to the ground apart from God. So everything is in God's hand. You know, I think there's a song. He got the whole world in his hand, you know, you know something like that. Yes, it's been a grueling year with COVID-19 pervading our land and all across the world since the outbreak of this new virus. The world seems out of control, aggravating people's fear, anxiety. Uh, we hear people questioning, where is God in the middle of this chaos? During the COVID-19, we've seen the increase in depression, substance use, and suicidal rate. Um, but the scripture assures us that God is in control. And when things like this happen, it guides us to have a right attitude, which is come back to the Lord. The scripture says, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider or think or pray God has made the one as well as the other so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. So in times like this, we must consider and think and pray and ask God, God, what do you want to tell us through this? God, what do you want to say to us? Mark Bailey um, is a former president at Dallas Theological Seminary. He is a very gifted Bible scholar. I had this opportunity ever since I've taken classes from the school um you know from him and i'm i'm always impressed by how ample knowledge and um and humility he has uh, in the lord in the bible but anyway he thoroughly looked at the bible from the first page to the last with the word pestilence pestilence in his mind and he found out that these plagues plagues or pandemics in the bible come for two primary reasons Number one is to expose the idols of the pagan culture, meaning that everything we thought we needed, everything we wanted, or everything we thought is essential, isn't actually on God's list of satisfaction. What we thought is important isn't really true, isn't really crucial to God's perspective. 
And number two is to call God's people, to bring his people back into a closer relationship with him. So the reason why God is sort of allowing this pestilence in the history of Israel in the the Bible is number one is expose emptiness. Number two, redirect the focus, resetting the priorities. And he adds the purpose of God's discipline is always for our restoration. The purpose of God's discipline is always for our restoration. The Bible says the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines sometimes forcefully, some other times gently. But the bottom line of doing that is God wants to bring his people back. God wants his sons and daughters back to him. That's the father's heart. The image that a shepherd chasing after his lost sheep. That's the heart of God for humanity. Now God's purpose for humanity, humanity is restoration and salvation, not annihilation. But think about this. If God's love for, you know, if God's love is not for us, he wouldn't have sacrificed his only son in the first place, right? So before the final judgment, every judgment beforehand is God stretching out his grace to call on his people and saying, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. Yet we find in the Bible and in human history, and, um, and we don't have to go far, right? Because in our own lives, we can say that you know, people don't come back. They don't repent. They don't make a turnaround. The Bible, we find, I smote you and every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew and hail, see this, Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. O Lord, do not your eyes look for faithfulness? You have smitten them, but they did not weaken. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. So back to this question, what does God want to tell us? While this invisible enemy is sweeping all across the continents and in the shadow of the valley of death hovering over every community and household, what's the message of God that we ought to hear? And can you hear God whispering to you? Come back to me. Come back to my word. Come back to my statutes. Come back to my orders. Come back to my principles. Come back to my promise. Apostle Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, we find he was urging the people to work out of your salvation. When he made this remark, he wasn't thinking of non-believers or seekers in his mind, but the Christians in the Philippian church. He was urging his Christian friends who came to know Christ, who have been already saved by the grace of God, and telling them this, to work out of your own salvation with fear and trembling. You may think, what does that mean? Work out your salvation. Aren't they Christians? Aren't they already saved by having faith in the Lord? And Paul knows it well that people are saved by their faith. Okay? It's not out of our works. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Then what's the meaning of work out of your salvation? That Paul talks about here. What Paul really meant here is this. You have to act like Christians. You have to be like Christians. You have to live like Christians. You have to demonstrate day by day what it means to have salvation in and through Jesus Christ. You have to work it out of your salvation. And Paul kindly gave us a clue what the best way to demonstrate our salvation. He said in the beginning of verse 12 of chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Dem- demonstrate your salvation with fear and trembling. By how? By your obedience. Obedience. The Christian faith, the Christian life, is worked out through obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. For Paul, obedience was a primary responsibility of the Christians and the church, because it proves who we are as Christians, who we are as a church. 
our obedience proves who our master is, our, our loyalty proves who our Lord and Savior is, right? Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. And he also said, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. His last command to his disciples, teach others everything I commanded you to obey. Teach them to obey all that I had commanded you. Well, that's the final grand mission for all disciples of Jesus. Unfortunately, many who call themselves as Christians are keep repeating the cycle of disobedience. We act like stiff-necked people. It's like, it's not your will, but my will. It's not what you said to me, but it's what I want to hear. Instead of obeying Jesus' words and teachings as it is, we act like we've forgotten them or we don't take them seriously. Or fundamentally, we don't really regard Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If we really look down, deep down in our hearts, we say he is, but in reality, it's not true. There's always something else that we fear more than God. There's always something else we love and we trust more than we trust and we love the Lord. This week, one of the headline news was, the, was that Pope Francis approved and called for a civil union for homosexuals. One of the, highlight, one of the highest officers of the church today, uh, church leadership today, publicly announced that he is endorsing this human act and desire. Immediately after this remark was made, it disturbed many people's hearts. I've seen a, a righteous anger spring up from the Catholic community. They became outraged because Pope, whatever the intention triggered him to say so, or whatever the underlying message that was, but in actual, what he has done and said is, is propelling the sinning that goes against the teachings of Jesus and the church doctrine that clearly state that under no circumstance can they be approved. Jesus' teaching for marriage is crystal clear. And it's between one man and one woman. At the beginning of creation, Jesus said, God made male and female. And the marriage is those to become one. There's no between, there's no footnotes. Yes, it's true that we have to love all people, right? And welcome all people. Who am I to judge others? We are all sinners. I don't judge. I can't judge. Let's never forget this. We are not the judge, but he is. We are not the teacher, but he is. We are not the lawgiver, but our Lord is. You see, I, I have seven and three-year-olds old living with me. Sometimes when I say it's wrong, they start questioning me. Why? Why that it's wrong? Why that it lying is wrong? Why that it stealing is wrong? Why did it such and such is wrong? So I try to give them a nice answer, but I realize their question will never be silenced until they hear me saying, you know what? It's wrong because God said so, period. I'm not the lawgiver, but God is. Thanks be to God, right? If you eliminate, eliminate God, implying his law and order, you start getting into a trouble because you can't really find the base of your judgment. Everything becomes relative. Every opinion can be right. That's the one of the fundamental errors in the argument of atheism and or humanistic movement. They have no firm ground to support when they say this is right or wrong. John Jay, um, first U.S. Chief Justice, Justice, said, No human society has ever been able to maintain both order and freedom, both cohesiveness and liberty apart from the moral precepts of the Christian religion applied and accepted by all the classes. Should our republic err, forget this, fundamental precepts of governance, men are certain to shed their responsibilities for licensedness, and this great experiment will then surely be doomed. After the news broke out, I've seen people crying out to ask for prayers for Pope and, and for the church. The sad reality that I find um, from the Christianity today is that it's not the church that concerns the world, but it's the world concerning the church. How ironic is that, right? So I think that's why Paul was urging his Christian brothers and sisters 
to work out your own salvation. Give double efforts to be obedient to the teachings of Lord. The main thing is to keep the main thing, main thing. The, the best way to church to demonstrate and, and impact the world and give good things to the world is to be the church, to be obedient church to the teachings of the Lord because the, you know, the challenge is real and dire here with us. But remember, um, and this is a simple lighting hope, when the church becomes more and more corrupted, when the church and church leaders take pervaded ways from the teachings of the Lord, it was this time around when the great saints came out. It was this time around when the great saints came out. Martin Luther, for instance, nailed his 95 theses to reform the church. And when was that time? Who was in the papacy? It was Pope Leo X. Do you know who Pope Leo X is? Obviously, he was far from the teachings of the Bible. He was notorious for his extravagant spending. He is perhaps best remembered for selling indulgences, selling forgiveness of your sins. If you pay, you can pull out your deceased family or relatives out of purgatory, and you can save yourselves with a certain amount of money for your future sins. Upon his election as Pope, Leo stated, since God has given us the papacy, he said, let us enjoy it. It was born to Medici family in Florence. You know, Medici family, you know, the powerful and the wealthiest family in the West. So he grew up with his power and opulence. When England historian gave him a harsh evaluation, as he said, he was a pagan rather than a Christian. That was the Pope. And Pope <laughs> can be unholy as it is, as you see this. So it was at this time the church reformation emerged along with many saints. Martin Luther said, the church needs a reformation and this cannot be the work either of a single man as a Pope, but it must be that of the whole world. We need new Martin Luther. We need new saints, not from the church office, but from the grassroots rebels. Now I'd like to see, you know, new saints from Smith Chapel. If God, if the Holy Spirit stirs your heart, and motivates you and, and, um, and inspires you. A few centuries later, when England church, let's speak about England church, you know, that, you know they were greatly challenged. And seven, it was around the time of 17th century, you know, when there was a revolution in human thoughts, human philosophy, you know, uh, Descartes, um, I think, therefore I am. You know, all that liberal thoughts was, you know, coming, in, you know, coming into a place of, academia and church and it was that during that time the church um, the authority of the bible was greatly challenged and and there was a great movement in the church that they were compromising the authority of the bible with the human um, human thoughts and critical thinkings and it was around this time god called out the obedient people like john wesley charles wesley george whitfield who upheld the authority of the bible who did not satisfy with their lip service only, but committed their whole lives to follow the biblical principles as it is. And through them, the new revival took place in England. Toward the end of his life, Wesley's sermon and writings began reflecting a growing concern for the future of the people called Methodist. Obviously, the movement was, was on fire, you know, numerically speaking. You know, there were... 50,000 new Methodists in England, and um, which, by the way, began from a couple of college students in Oxford. So it only takes a spark, right? The new American church was growing rapidly, too, during this time. However, John saw um, signs of demise. On August 4, 1786, he wrote, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power, and this undoubtedly will be the case, unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. Back to the first question, God, what do you want to say to us? God, what do you want to say to me? I believe God has been constantly giving us a clue. 
one after another what he wants to say to you and to me and to all the world. COVID-19, flickering church leadership, shaking of the foundation of this nation, moral fluidity, natural disasters, more violence and wars, you name it. It's true that human civilization had a big advancement, right? We are now sending rockets into the universe. Science is able to clone human beings. AI can beat us in many different fields. We've been looking into ourselves, looking into science, looking into human knowledge, but where is salvation? It seems like we are going further and further away from our salvation. What's the message of God from all this? Say with me, come back to me. Come back to my word. Come back to my promise. In the end, all our spiritual warfare boils down to this challenge. Are we going to listen to the word of God or something else? That was a challenge for Adam and Eve. You know, the Satan, the serpent came up to Eve, deceiving her. You know, when, while God told Eve, you know, if you eat this fruit, you will, you will surely die. In other words, you will die, die. But serpent came and deceiving her, you will not die, die. <laughs> You'll be okay. I mean, that's the challenge for most of us, right? Even today, God said something, but there's another voice coming into our hearts. You know, it's okay. You know, I don't think, you know, God said it literally, you know. So I think the bottom line is the tension, the challenge between are we going to listen to God's word or human words? Are we trusting God or something else? Are we following biblical Jesus or modern Jesus that we fabricate him by pick and choose? So today, um, I want to close with a story. It's a story about Charles Spurgeon. He's known to be a prince of preachers. So it was on January 6, 1850. He was, uh, he was 15 years old. Charles Spurgeon was on his way to his home church, not out of urgency, but habitually. He was a Sunday Christian. And there was a blizzard, and it prevented him from going further. He turned the corner and found the small primitive Methodist church on Artillery Street, and he went in. Charles Spurgeon recounted this day likewise. Let's listen. Uh, let's see his own words, how he describes the day um, this, this thing happened. So this is Charles Spurgeon word. I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair now, had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a cord and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might be a dozen or 15 people. The minister did not come that morning. Snowed up, I suppose. A poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. He was ob obliged, ob obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say. The text was, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words lightly, rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in the text. It began thus, My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now, this, that, now that does not take a deal of effort. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man need not to go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man need not be worth a thousand years to look. Anyone can look. A child can look. But this is what the text says. Then it says, look unto me. Ah, said he in broad axis. Many of ye are looking to yourselves. No use looking there. You'll never find comfort in yourselves. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I'm hanging on the cross. Look, I'm dead and buried. 
Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend. I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, look to me, look to me. When he had got about the length and managed to spin out 10 minutes, he was at the length of his tether. Then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say, with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. He then said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit before. However, it was a good blow struck. He continued, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you'll be saved. Then he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist can, young man, look to Jesus. There and then the cloud was gone, the darkness had rolled away. In that moment, I saw the sun and I could have reasoned that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Jesus. So today, my final, final word for you and for me and for our church and for the vision of our church is to continue the spirit of only a primitive Methodist can do. People look to Jesus Christ. People turn back to Jesus' words and obey his words and teach others everything that he taught us. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, um, shoo. The battle is here, Lord. Um, the challenge is always here. Um, but it's simple, Lord. Um, it's simple as simple as it can be. Um, that, that you're asking our heart, you're, you're asking our humble heart to obey your words, obey your guidance, obey your authority, obey, trust and obey in your greater will, even though Sometimes we don't really understand fully, but later on, um, we'll, we'll see why. We'll see why. Um, a man's heart can plan his own ways, but it is you who will direct our path. Um, so Lord, we ask that you help our hearts, help our spirit, our soul, um, help our understanding so that uh, we may have this humility, we may have this heart of yours, but Jesus, you yourself um, showed us the example of how you obeyed your Father. So Lord, help us, even though it may ask a great sacrifice, ask a great burden um, to the point of death on the cross, but Lord, help us to, uh, to obey and trust in you, Lord. Because in you, there is promise, there is everlasting life, everlasting um, joy and happiness and, and meaningfulness, Lord. So thank you. And um, thank you for what you, have, what you have been doing. And thank you for the things that you will do in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's one of our hearts in, in this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all sing together this song. Oh, brother, be faithful, soon Jesus will come, for whom we have waited so long. Oh, soon we shall enter our glorious home and join in the conqueror's song. Oh, brother, be faithful, for why should we prove unfaithful to him who has shown? Such deep, such unbounded and infinite love, who died to redeem us his own. 
O oh, brother, be faithful, the city of gold, prepared for the good and the blessed, is waiting its portals of pearl to unfold, and welcome thee into thy rest. Then, brother, prove faithful, not long shall we stay, in weariness here and forlorn. Time's dark night of sorrow is wearing away, we haste to the glorious morn. O brother, be faithful, he soon will descend, creation's omnipotent king. While legions of angels his chariot attend, and powers of victory bring. O oh, brother, be faithful, and soon shalt thou hear thy Savior pronounce the glad word. Well done, faithful servant, thy title is clear to enter the joy of thy Lord. O oh, brother, be faithful, eternity's years shall tell for thy faithfulness now. When bright smiles of gladness shall scatter thy tears, a coronet gleam on thy brow. O brother, be faithful, the promise is sure, that waits for the faithful and try. To reign with the ransomed, immortal and pure, and ever with Jesus above.